Thank you, Gracie. Well, good morning. Welcome to this wonderful sauna that we call Iowa. You know, growing up in Oklahoma and Kansas, I thought it was hot down there, and it was hot, but there wasn't the humidity like there is in Iowa. And there, there's something about it. It's just miserable. But I stayed. I told myself I'd never stay in Iowa, and here I am almost 30 years later, and I've never left. So, <laughs> Well, welcome this morning to Newburgh Chester. Announcements have been up on the screen. Um, yesterday, Carla and I got a phone call nobody wants to get, and um, Carnahan's, um, Charles and his family called, and Gene was taken into the emergency room and admitted into hospice yesterday and passed away at 3.30 this morning. Um, so Gene and Charles have been long time attenders here and very faithful. And I'm ready for 2020 to be over, guys. <laughs> this is getting, starting to wear on me. Um, we prayed with the family. We cried with the family, but we know this, that Jean is now no longer suffering, and that she has taken that step into eternity and is now with her Heavenly Father, and there is no more pain, there's no more sorrow, there's no more tears or heartache. The heartache's here. The heartache's here with us because we've lost a loved one, but we can rejoice in this and knowing that we someday will be with her in eternity. Also, um, be praying for uh, the family of Nancy Sears. That would be the um, sister-in-law of Marilyn Barnes. Nancy passed away um, earlier this week in Des Moines. And visitation will be today at Smith Funeral Home, where my wife's at, I think 2 o'clock. Is that right? 2 to 6. And then the funeral's tomorrow at Calvary Baptist. The church, Carla, the church is having the funeral, the whole thing, do you know? No. Just the meal afterwards. Okay, so if you're able to go and just support the uh, Marilyn and her family and the Searses, um, Nancy is uh, a good friend of our family. Nancy and Larry, if, if you knew them in Grinnell, um, just people who put others above themselves all the time. One of the first families I met when I came to Grinnell and, and met Carla, and they took us in, took me in. They kind of adopted some of our older children as their own. They're just a wonderful, wonderful Christian family. Um, also, Susie Sondak will be having surgery um, this week on, on her neck and back areas. Be praying for her. And then the Barneses, uh, their son-in-law in um, East Coast. I can't think of where he's at in East Coast, but New Hampshire. Uh, had a complete block blockage of his widow maker, and so he's going in for open heart surgery later this week. So be praying for him as well. It was um it was a rough week. Carla and I though uh, had the privilege uh, to be invited to the family leader conference in Des Moines on Friday, and just a little background here is that. Um, Right before the coronavirus hit, God just laid upon my heart, I mean, j just a burden to preach a salvation message because time is short. We look at the things that are going on around us and with, with, with our communities, with our governments, with the world around us, and we see the writing on the wall that God is preparing his people for his return. And at the time, I didn't really understand why I had such this burden. And if you've noticed, as we've gone through the book of John, looking at who Jesus Christ is, what he did, what he represents, everything led back to salvation. Everything that we looked at led back to what Jesus Christ was going to ultimately do on the cross for you and me. And so as we were at this conference on uh, Friday, I was just blown away by how God reassured in my heart what we are studying and what we're preaching on right now um, through the book of John. Every single speaker 
that got up from Del Tackett, who did the Truth Project, to Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State for Donald Trump, every single one of them brought out the point that we're going to talk about today, and that is we are to love our neighbors. We are to love one another. And I believe it was Joel Rosenberg, the, the Christian author, he said, you know, we're to love our neighbors. And then he brought up Matthew chapter 5, and he said, I want to start in verse uh, 41. It says, and whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And then verse 46 says this. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? We are called by Christ to love one another, to love our neighbors, and more importantly, to love our enemies. Dan Nisley stopped me Monday night after the council meeting and really hit this right in the center of my chest talking about the community that we're in. And I'm not talking about Grenada, I'm just talking about Newburgh. We look around us and we see the houses and, and, and we see the people, but do we have a burden for their souls? Do we have a burden for their hearts? Are we really truly being the gospel to the people around us? That's a question that each and every one of us need to look at today. Are we truly being the servants that Jesus Christ has called us to be? And it's hard. It's hard to look at the people who laugh at you and persecute you and completely you know, live a life contrary to what the Word of God says. But Jesus didn't say, pick and choose who you share the Word with. He said, go into all nations, teaching them all, all of the things that I've commanded you, teaching every one of them. That's what we're called to do. We're called to be servants. Not only to the people we love, but to the people who hate us. That's what makes Christianity so different. And so time is short, ladies and gentlemen. It is short. And we need to be praying, not only for our loved ones, but for those who are unlovely those who rub us the wrong way, those who get under our skin. In a minute, Stephen Harris is going to come up and read to us our call to worship day from the book of John, John chapter 13. And we're going to see an example, the first really true example of what Jesus laid out for us, how we're supposed to live our life of being a servant. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for the freedom. We thank you for the opportunity to come into your house, to praise you, to worship you, to study your word, and to know that you are the King of Kings, you are the Lord of Lords, and that you love each and every one of us, regardless of who our parents were, regardless of of our financial or social status, regardless of our skin color. It doesn't matter. You love us. And Father, sometimes that's hard for us to understand. It's hard for us to understand that your son came and set an example for each and every one of us to live a life that was selfless. That we are called to be servants of one another. We are called to be servants of those who don't love us. And Father, so I just pray today that you would just give us that burden. That burden to love the people around us. To love our neighbors. To love our enemies. To be your hands and feet extended to the world around us. So Father, as we prepare today to study your word and to look into... Scripture, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us here today. 
that you would guide us, that you would keep us, Lord, in your hands, and that your Holy Spirit would open up the word to us like never before, and that if there be anything in this message today at all that comes from man, I pray that you would remove it and guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, that you would protect us and guide us behind the cross of Calvary. Father, be with us today. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Stephen's now going to come up and read to us our call to worship from John chapter 13, verses 1 through 20. Uh, words will be on the screen. If you have your Bibles, would you open them to John chapter 13, please? Now, now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Jesus Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Jesus said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. When he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. But, but I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes, that when it comes, does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I sent receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me.
there. I mean, I was off the whole time I was singing. You could hear me anyways. I know better than that. <laughs> Delmer always gets on me about being too loud. There we go. All right. Anyone else? All right. Join me in prayer, if you would, please. And Father, what a glorious privilege you have given us through your Son, Jesus Christ. No longer do we have to go through the priests. No longer do we have to go through the blood of goats and bulls. We can now go directly to the throne of grace because of your Son's sacrifice for each and every one of us. And Father, have you heard the request here today of family members who have lost loved ones, of surgeries that are going to be performed, cancer surgeries, heart surgeries, surgeries upon neck and the back area. And Lord, I just pray today that you would be in each and every one of these situations, that your hand would touch doctors, touch nurses, that you would guide them, that you would guide each and every one of these doctors in these situations. And that these situations would be used for your kingdom, for your glory, that pain would be removed. And the doctors and the nurses would know exactly who you are because of what they see being performed in these operating rooms. And Lord, for the families who have lost loved ones today, it's always hard for us here on this side of glory to understand why you have called someone home but we know this. Your word promises us that if they know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they are now rejoicing with you and that someday, because of that promise, we will be together with them in eternity when we know the Lord is our Savior as well. So, Father, even though the pain is real, the grief is real, let us hold on to those promises. Let us hold on to that truth that someday we will be reunited with our loved ones in eternity with you. And Father, as we prayed earlier, as we look into your word today, that if there be anything in this message at all that comes from man that is my opinion or anyone else's, I just pray that you would remove it today. That you would guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus because again, Lord, it's not my opinion or anyone else's that changes hearts and lives. It is your word, your precious holy word, Father that changes us from the inside out, that makes us a new creation. So, Father, I pray today that you teach us from your word, that your Holy Spirit guides us and ministers to our hearts and lives, that you protect us from the opinions of man. Guard us behind the cross of Calvary today, I pray, in Jesus' precious name, amen. So I kind of gave you that little mini-sermon there at the beginning, because I was just amazed this week of how God worked as I, I prepared and, and worked on the ser sermon on Monday, Tuesday, and then finally tying things up on Wednesday because I knew I didn't have Friday to work. And I'm just, I'm like, God, why did you, th th this burden that I've got, it's just, it's just amazing to me. Uh, you always care about the lost. You're, you always want to share the gospel. But th this, this knot that's in, in, in my stomach now because of people that I know who have completely and totally rejected the Word of God. And we go to this conference, and the very first speaker, the very first speaker, he says, guys, we are here to love our neighbors regardless, regardless of what they say to us, regardless of what they do to us. We are to actively engage them in the gospel. And I'm like, thank you, Lord. Thank you for reminding me that. Thank you for revealing to me why you place this in me. And then the next speaker gets up, and then the next speaker, and the speaker after that. Every single speaker was reassuring and hitting home that point that we are to be servants, and we are to love our neighbors and share the gospel. And so up until this point, as we read through the book of John... We see Jesus as who he is. 
We see him as a miracle worker, the great physician. We see him as the living water. We see him as the fountain. We see him as the, the resurrection and the life. We see him as the king of kings. Now in John chapter 13, Jesus sits down with his disciples. And he says, now we're going to put into practice everything that you've seen. And I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. We see the heart of Jesus in John 13. We see his mission. And more importantly, we see Jesus showing his disciples the kind of heart that we are supposed to have. He's showing us how to give ourselves completely over to the service of others, about putting other people before ourselves. And so Stephen read to us, the first 20 verses of John 13, and we see here a humble servant in Jesus Christ. You know, it, it starts right there in verse 1. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. See, he knows. The word tells us right here, he knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew the end was near and that the cross was inevitable, that that, that was coming. Yet his, oh, his heart was overcome, not with fear, not with anxiety, not with anything like that at all. It was overcome with love. It says he loved them to the end. He loved them perfectly. He loved his disciples unconditionally. And he loved them for all eternity. It never wavered. Even in this hour of crisis. Even when he knows what is about to happen in just a few short hours. And see that love is the same for us today. And I know sometimes when, when, when I'm preaching I can come across angry and upset. But I'm, 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 I'm more excited by the word of God. I'm more excited about what Christ is doing in the hearts and lives of men and women. And I, 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 I want to see everyone grab a hold of the love of Christ. I want to see everyone grab a hold and understand what Christ has done in their hearts and their lives. So I get excited and I get loud. Because it's important. It's the most important decision that you will ever make. I've heard it said before, since, since the time I first got saved, it's more important than who you marry. It's more important than the house you buy. It's more important than the job you take. It's more important than the car you drive. Because this one decision will affect you for eternity. See, Jesus loves us the same today as he loved his disciples 2,000 plus years ago. The prophet Jeremiah wrote this in Jeremiah 31.3. He says, the Lord has appeared of old to me saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. See, regardless of the situation, regardless of what is happening in your life or transpires in your life, you are loved perfectly. You are loved unconditionally by God. And more importantly, you are loved eternally by God. And we see that right here in verse 1. You skip over to verse 3. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God. He understood what God was doing in his heart and his life. That he came into this world to live a perfect, sinless life and become sin for a fallen creature. That's you, that's me. We are born into a life of sin. I've told this story hundreds of times of how when Jonah, when we had his baby dedication, and the little bald-headed preacher stood in front of me and said, Lord, we thank you for this bundle of sin. And I wanted to smack him right in the nose. I'm like, how dare you say that about my child? But he's right. We are all born into a life of sin. We are a fallen creature. And that's why Christ had to come to save us from that life of sin. Paul wrote this in Philippians 2 and verse 8. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death 
of, a, of the cross. And what we need to understand here is that the cross that Jesus came for is the absolute, indisputable proof of his love for you. It is a monument that, yes, people are calling to be tore down today. I read an article a week or two ago about, about a movement now where they want churches, Christian churches in the United States, to remove the cross from their buildings because it's offensive. It is offensive. I guarantee you it's offensive. And it's even more offensive when you don't know the one who hung on it. When you don't know him personally, it's a monument that will never be torn down. It's a monument to the awesome love of God for you and for me. And we need to cling to that cross. In verse 2, it says, And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. See, Jesus understood what was happening, and he understood the heart of Judas. He knew exactly what was going to happen. Verse 11 says, For he knew who would betray him, therefore he said, You are not all clean. He knew exactly what was going on, but he continued to be a servant, a servant to all. Verses 4 and 5, it says, he rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. I think sometimes we have a hard time understanding what just happened here in Scripture. In Jesus' time, it was customary that the slave of the house, when guests would arrive would bow before the guests and wash their feet clean. You have to remember, they're open. A lot of them didn't even wear shoes, but they wore sandals and dirt and dusty roads. And so it was the slave's job to clean the feet of the guests. Jesus took on that role. It wasn't his role to take on according to society according to society it should have been somebody else back off in the corner of the room somebody who w was not at the same level as jesus christ but jesus takes on this role he gets up from the table begins to wash the feet of the disciples and as he washes the feet i want you to understand something he is washing the feet of the very person who would later, that same evening, betray him and sell him into the hands of his enemies. And he knew the heart of Judas. It tells us that in verse 2 and verse 11 that I read. He knew his heart. He knew his motives. He knew the plans. But get this, Jesus still loved him. And he still took on the role of a servant and washed his feet. His love never failed. His love will never fail you. It will never end. And some of you here today, some of you watching online, you can reject Jesus Christ. That's your choice. Some of you have done that. Some of you have rejected Him. You've rejected every single attempt of Jesus Christ to call you to Him. You've written it off. You said, well, it's just a bunch of, you know, fairy tales. It's just a bunch of weak people. You've come up with every excuse to reject him, but no matter how many times you reject him, you're never going to be able to turn off his love for you. He proves it to us right here. He knew exactly what Judas was going to do. He knew he was going to be sold for 30 pieces of silver. And yet his love was still there for him. It didn't matter what he was going to do because he loved him. Because he was the humble servant. And I want you to look at the shock of Peter here. 
verses 6 and 7. It said, Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter's shocked. He can't believe it. I mean, Peter's the one who talked first and thought second. Okay, a lot, like a lot of us, right? I do that a lot. Just ask my wife. She'll confirm that with you. But Peter here is shocked, and he can't believe that Christ, his Savior, would want to serve him, take on the role of a servant of a slave, and bow down before him and wash his feet. And when we grab a hold of this idea, when we see this, and understand what Christ wants to do in our hearts and our lives, we are amazed. We stand in awe of the Savior that He would want to wash my feet, that His love for me is beyond our comprehension. That's what we see here. We see a love that is completely beyond the comprehension of men. Peter then replies to Christ, and he says, You shall never wash my feet. That's pretty brazen. That's pretty bold to look Jesus Christ in the face and say, "Uh Uh-uh, you're not doing this. He can't believe it. He says, You'll never wash my feet. It's, it's, It's the equivalent of being irreverent here. We have to understand that he's Jesus' disciple. He's following him. And one of the first rules or conditions of being a disciple is being obedient, of following their master. Peter here is refusing to submit to God, and he does it through a display of what we call would be a false humility. He says, well, Lord, you're, you, you can't wash my feet. No, 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 no. I'm not worthy of that, Lord. You're right, we're not. None of us are. But Jesus reminds him of a great truth. He reminds him that unless you are willing to submit to God and his commandments, you can have no fellowship with the Lord. Later on in John 14, Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, if you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. See, Peter was learning a valuable lesson here, that obedience... To the master is proof of your love. Obedience is proof of your love. True fellowship with Jesus is found in humble submission, humble obedience to his plan. And so many times we think, well, no, I've got to go out and I've got to do things. I've got to do works for God. That's how I show my love to him. And yes, he loves it when we do things for him. But what we have to understand here is that obedience to his plan is the proof of his love. I heard an analogy one time from a missionary. He said, you know, it's like me telling my son, I want you to mow the yard, take out the garbage, and vacuum the living room while I'm gone. And so he comes home and none of it's done. And the kid has spent all day in the garage and built his dad a birdhouse. And he says, Dad, I built this for you. It's specially for you. And he says, but I ask you to mow the yard, take out the garbage, and vacuum the yard. Or vacuum the yard. <laughs> vacuum the, the, car, the, the living room. Those are the things I asked you to do. But yeah, I made you this. Yeah, you loved me. You thought about me, but you didn't obey me. You didn't do what I asked you to do. That's how we show the love. We show the love of Christ by doing what he's asked us to do. Jesus replies to Simon and he says, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. 
Peter hears this. He hears this rebuke from Jesus, and he instantly understands that something needs to change. He says, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands, also my head. He understands it's just gentle rebuke, and he throws himself before God, and he says, cleanse all of me. Cleanse all of me. When he has this attitude, notice how the attitude changes. Where it's like, God, you're not washing my feet because I'm not worthy of you washing my feet. He says, Lord, if you've got to wash my feet, just cleanse all of me. Wash all of me. That's the attitude of surrender. That's that attitude of obedience that God will bless in each and every one of us. See, Peter now, all of a sudden, is being motivated by something different. He's being motivated by the thought of being closer to God. Is that your motivation today? Is that your motivation to be closer to Him? Every single day, draw yourself closer and closer and closer to Him by the study of His Word, by praying to Him, spending time with Him, being obedient to Him. When you receive Christ as your Savior, He washes you from your sins forever. The sins are gone. Apostle Peter wrote this, verse, uh, chapter 1 of 1 Peter 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Christ has redeemed you. He has cleansed you and made you whole. You've been cleansed from head to toe by the blood of Christ. And as you go through life, you need to understand that sometimes we mess up. We are not a perfect creature. We look at today's society and we see this every day on the news of what they call the cancel culture. Well, if Matt messed up, you know, 20 years ago, everything he said from that point on and before is worthless. It doesn't matter anymore. But we have to understand that Christ redeemed us. He paid for our past and present and future sins. And sometimes we need to come to him Sometime we need that restoration of fellowship with Him. We don't need to get saved again. We just need God to remind us that there is a true joy, a spiritual joy, when we practice what we call instant confession of sins, failures before God and man before the throne of Christ. When we keep those short accounts with God, I'm not saying you're losing your salvation at all. But what I am saying, there are things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis that grieve the heart of God. And we need to keep those accounts short. We need to have those daily confessions, those time with Jesus. See, Jesus is still in the business of washing feet today. He's still in the, in the business of cleansing hearts and soul. I love the, what David wrote in Psalms 32. He says, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Selah. You can't hide it. So many of us think, well, nobody knows. It's my own little pet sin that I've got over here in the dark corner of my closet. I only get it out, you know, a few times a month, a few times a year, whatever it might be. But nobody else knows. You can't hide it from Christ. He knows what we are. He knows when we're just trying to be religious and play the right cards. He knows when we're being hypocritical. He knows when we're insincere about our faith. And here's the big key. He knows whether we're saved or not. See, you might fool me, 
You might fool the person sitting next to you. You might fool every single one of us. But I'm going to guarantee you this. You are never going to pull the wool over Jesus' eyes. He sees the heart of men and women. And then there's a call to action here. Jesus is showing his disciples for the first time. He's truly showing them exactly what it is that they need to do. He sets a standard by which they are to live their lives. And by in turn, we are to live our lives. In verse 12, he says he washed their feet, all of their feet. He sat down again and said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for I, so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. See, you don't earn the respect of other people by forcing their obedience, by commanding them to do things. You know, we laugh about it in, in our house. It's not a dictatorship, or it's not a democracy. It's a dictatorship at my house, and I'm the law. It only goes so far, right? There, there, there comes a time where you're going to rebel against the law. Jesus set a standard here. He set a standard of being a servant because you cannot force respect through forced obedience. It's not going to happen. You have to be that servant because the path of greatness, the path to greatness in this life is through humility. The way to true life today is by dying to yourself. The way to get in this life is to give to others. And the way to greatness is by becoming a servant, by bowing yourself before others. See, Jesus didn't serve the ones that he preferred. Verse 16, Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is no greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. He doesn't just serve the preferred here. Simon Peter would deny him three times before dawn. Thomas would doubt the word and refuse to believe the resurrection of Jesus. Not until I touch his hands and put my hands in his side will I believe. He refused to believe in the resurrection. And Jesus, Judas would sell his beloved Jesus to his enemies for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus didn't allow any of this, any of this at all, to cloud his love or his service for those around him. He treated every single one of his disciples equal, equally. Every single one of them. The true servant knows that they must serve all and serve them equally. They don't pick favorites. It's not, oh, th this person over here does so much for the church. This person over here gives so much money to the church. No, you love them equally. You serve them equally. It doesn't matter your position in society. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter even how much you do. You can't pick favorites. You have to have the heart of Christ and serve the people who love you. And you have to serve their enemies just as you would serve anyone else. That's the model that Christ laid out for us. Can we honestly, can we take a look inside ourselves here this morning? Can we honestly say that we serve everyone the same? That we treat everyone as Christ would have us to do? Do you remember every wrong ever performed against you? Do you still hold grudges to those people that hurt you years ago? Jesus said this in Mark 16. He said, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to a few people. 
No, it's not what he said, guys. He said to every creature, everyone, it doesn't matter who you are. We are to go into the world and preach the gospel. For he who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves. And yes, love our enemies. We do that by serving them. Verse 17, Jesus said, If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. He's telling them, put it into action, guys. Put it into action. When you do this, you can be assured of the Lord's blessing in our lives because there's no greater joy. I don't care who you are. There's no greater joy than serving one another in the name of Jesus Christ. No matter how small it might seem or how big and daunting it might seem, there's no greater joy than serving one another. So why is it so difficult for us? Why is it so hard for us to serve others? Jesus never had a problem, right? Jesus lays it all out for us. All we got to do is follow what he laid out for us. We need to lean on him. God will help us to develop that servant's heart. God will help us to love our neighbors, to love our enemies. But we need to get into the place in our lives where we are more concerned with the welfare of our neighbors than we are with our own. We are more concerned with the eternal salvation of our neighbors, of the people down the street, with our co-workers, our family members, than we are of our own. Jesus said this in Matthew 22. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Said this before. Love God, love people. That's what we're called to do. It's that simple. It is that simple. We put God first in everything we do, and then we love everyone around us, regardless of who they are, regardless of what they say about us, regardless of what they do to us. We love them. See, people don't care how much we know until they know how much you care. We've heard that before. And we got to show them. We need to reach the place in our lives where we are more concerned with promoting our brothers and our sisters than we are with ourselves. Putting other people ahead of us. Paul wrote this in the first part of Romans. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to the salvation for a few who believe. No. It's everyone. Do you get this? It's everyone. I don't understand what's going on in the world today. I don't understand why we can't grab a hold of this. Why we can't share the gospel. We get inside our four walls and we shut the door. And we think, well, they'll come to us. They'll come to us. No, God told us to go out. Jesus told us to go out into the highways and the byways, and compel them to come in. So wrapping this all up, if we were to sum up your life today, I want you to take an honest look and ask yourself, can you honestly say that others come before you in your thinking, in your serving, in your actions? Do you always put the thoughts of other people before you? Can you honestly say you're following God's example, including salvation? Have you believed on Christ and asked Him to be Lord and Master of your life? Have you given your life up in believer's baptism, where you've been immersed in the water, been buried, been raised? And given a new life. Is that your life? Maybe some of you here today are like Judas. 
You're in the church. You're doing exactly what people expect you to do. You're serving. You're serving those around you, but you're surrounded by the trappings of what I call the American Jesus, the American Christianity. You're like Judas. You've never truly given your life over. You've never truly been saved by the faith of Jesus Christ. You have a name. You think you're one of His, but you know deep down in your heart that you don't really know who He is. You don't really understand what it means to be a true servant, bowing your heart and life before others. If you're that today, I'm going to tell you something. There's hope for you because God is here today. Just like Judas, Jesus loves you. He loves you even yet today, and He will save you today if you will come to Him and bow your heart and life before Him. If you believe in Him. That's the beauty of our Lord. Will you respond to Him today? Will you come to Him today? Father, we thank You for Your Word. I thank You. Father, that your Son came willingly into this world to be the example of a servant for each and every one of us. And Lord, I pray today if there be anybody here, anybody who's watching online who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the acceptable day of salvation, that right where they're at, even as we're praying, they are crying out to you, that they believe on you, and they want you, Lord, to be the Lord and Master of their life. Father, maybe there's those here who realize that they're not being the servant that they're called to be, that they're not putting others ahead of themselves as your Son did for us. And so, Father, I pray today that you would continue to work in their hearts and their lives as they come to you today and they lay out their life before you and they ask for your guidance. They ask for your direction in their lives and how they would serve you and serve others, including their enemies. Father, let us never forget the power of the cross. Let us never forget what Jesus did for each and every one of us that day at Calvary. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn today is Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated. I pray that that's your prayer here today. That you give your life over to Jesus Christ. And moreover, that you are willing to be the servant that he has called you to be. If you're able to stand, would you stand with me in closing, please? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing Always only for my King Take my lips and let them be Filled with measures Filled with measures
messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a might would treasure with hold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose, every power as thou shalt choose. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee, ever only all for me. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne, it shall be thy royal throne. I pray that that's your prayer today that you give everything over to God uh, at the end of the uh, towards the end of the sermon I mentioned baptism and we are going to have a baptismal service we're going to do a little different um, on Sunday August 16th we're going to do it out at Carla Knight's place uh, down at the pond and so if you're interested you've never uh, been obedient to the ordinance of the Lord you've never been baptized by immersion we've talked about this before talk to me talk to Carla we'll sit down with you make sure you understand exactly what it is and we would love to have you just uh, uh, every one of us you know some of us have forgotten what that first love is and we've forgotten about that service that he's called us to do and sometimes I think it's okay it's okay to revisit some of those things and come back and say, yes, Lord, I'm, I'm ready today. I'm ready to die to my old self, to be buried in you and resurrected in you. And I'm here to proclaim to the world. It's not going to save you. Okay, baptism doesn't save you. Baptism tells the world that you are here to serve Jesus Christ. Pray with me, please. Father, we thank you as we close here today. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your son, Jesus. And I pray he goes with us in everything that we do. That your Holy Spirit just walks with us every step this week. And that you would use us as your hands and feet extended to the world around us. That we would be your servant that you've called us to be. That you would give us opportunities, Lord, to share the love of Christ. Not only with our neighbors and loved ones, but also with our enemies. Father, go with us this week as we go our separate ways. Bring us back here safely again next week so we can praise and worship you as a blessed church family. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. And you are dismissed.